Hello and welcome Grade 12 Accounting Learners from myself Mahesh Lal. In today's lesson we are going to be focusing on VAT, Value Added Tax, and thereafter we're going to be looking at stock valuations. Stock valuations, what exactly will we focus on? The first in first out method versus the weighted average method. But to get started let's firstly look at VAT. Right, guys, now when we talk about VAT, remember people, VAT is an acronym for value added tax. And if I had to ask you, what exactly is VAT? Yes, VAT is a tax. So let's just fill that in. Value added tax is a tax charged by whom? It is charged by the government, or in other words, it's a tax that is paid over to SARS. So we've got tax, but remember people, this tax is, yes, charged by the government or by the receiver of revenue. Now remember, we do not physically pay the government. We don't physically go to um, the government and hand over the VAT or the tax that we should be paying. Instead, we use agents or VAT vendors. VAT vendors are used to collect the tax on behalf of the government. So you've got the government, but they will use businesses to collect tax on their behalf. So our focus is going to be on businesses. How does a business know exactly how much of tax or how much to VAT, of VAT rather, to pay the receiver of revenue at the end of the month or at the end of two months? Right, so let's now focus, focus on businesses. Okay is going to change the color. So that's going to be our focus. Now we know that businesses buy products in order to sell these products to us, the consumers. Now every time a business buys a product or buys stock, they will pay what we call input that or VAT input. Every time they sell the product to us, the consumers, the business then will charge VAT to their customers and that VAT is what we call VAT output or output VAT. Let's just use a line to divide the two. Right, now I want to focus on these two concept, concepts. What is VAT output? What is VAT input? If we look at the concept VAT output, I've already explained. This is the VAT that the business will charge their customers. VAT input, on the other hand, is VAT that the business pays whenever they buy trading stock or whenever they buy certain items that included VAT. Right, now looking at VAT input versus VAT output, remember at the end of the day that VAT needs to be paid to SARS, it needs to go to the government. So the business basically draws up or the accountant rather will have a T account or a ledger account for VAT output as well as a ledger account for VAT input. Okay, I just want to change the color of my pen quickly. Right. All ledger accounts, grade 12s, you know from grade 8 or from grade 10, must be classified into assets, owner's equity, and or liabilities. So let's start with VAT output. Whenever the business charges their customers VAT, that VAT output 
although it goes into their bank account, the business's bank account, that money does not belong to the business and must be paid over to SARS. Therefore, that output is considered to be a liability for the business. Okay, so whenever we collect that VAT output, remember, it's not our money, it does not belong to the business, and hence it is a liability for the business. It needs to be handed over to the receiver of revenue. Let's now look at VAT input. VAT input, on the other hand, is an asset to the business, and I'm going to explain in a moment why it is an asset. So for now, an asset increases on the debit side, we all know, decreases on the credit side. VAT input is considered to be an asset because this is the VAT that the business can claim back from the receiver. In other words, it is money that is owed to the business. The business has already paid this VAT when they were buying stock and SARS, therefore, needs to refund or pay back this VAT input that the business has paid. So VAT input, whenever the business collects VAT, sorry, not collects, but rather whenever the business pays VAT, it's considered to be input VAT. Right, still looking at these two T accounts, I'm going to put in certain figures to explain how are we going to work out or calculate how much of that we've got to pay the receiver. VAT output, let's assume our output VAT is an amount of 2,000 Rand. That's all the VAT I've charged my customers. My VAT input, on the other hand, VAT that I or the business has paid is 1,500. We can now work out how much of VAT we are actually owing the receiver. So if I compare my output VAT, this is how much I should pay the receiver. But this is the amount, my input VAT, that the receiver needs to pay me. So obviously, guys, I'm not going to go now and pay SARS 2,000 Rand and tell SARS, you are owing me 1,500 Rand. It doesn't work that way. We're going to now look at what is the net difference between the two. So the 2,000 Rand less the 1,500 Rand, we have to pay VAT or our VAT payable to the receiver is merely a difference between the two and we've got to pay in this case 500 Rand to SARS. Now this is normally shown in a T account called the VAT control account but we're going to look at that in a bit more detail when I explain some of the VAT concepts. Right, let's go straight to the VAT concepts. I know I've explained VAT in a nutshell, but let's now look at the specific concepts where you are sometimes tested on. So this is theory that you need to know. Right, the first bit of information. Firstly, what is VAT? I've already explained that VAT is a tax, but let's go through the actual description. Value added tax or VAT is a tax that is charged on the supply of goods or services by a vendor. Okay, very, very important. The word vendor refers to the business. And remember, the business needs to be registered, um, registered for that. All right, let's take a very basic example. So we've got an example given to us, cash sales excluding VAT, 400 Rand. We've got the VAT given to us at 14%. And remember, people, 14% is the standard rate of VAT. So the VAT is 56 Rand. Your cash sale including VAT, all we're doing is adding on the VAT to arrive at an amount of 456 Rand. Right, very, very important grade 12s. When you are doing the calculations of VAT, remember a VAT question requires calculation. Very important for us to remember, excluding VAT in terms of percentage represents 100%. VAT, 
the standard rate of VAT is 14%, which means my selling price, including VAT, is 100 plus 14, 114%. Okay, let's move on to the next concept. VAT vendors. People, I've already mentioned that vendor is the business, but who specifically or which specific business can be considered as a VAT vendor? Vendors trading for VAT are obliged to collect VAT from their customers or their clients on behalf of SARS. Examples. Any business with a turnover, turnover here refers to sales. Any business with a turnover of more than 300,000 Rand a year. Guys, it was 300,000 Rand, but in 2009, this figure changed to 1 million Rand. I know some of the textbooks still have 300,000 Rand as the minimum requirement um, for registering as a VAT vendor, but people, this has changed to 1 million Rand. So any business with a turnover of more than 1 million Rand must register as a VAT vendor. And this is considered to be if your, your business exceeds the 1 million Rand turnover, you, you, it is compulsory for you to register for VAT, and this is considered to be compulsory registration. Right, what happens to a business that, um, whose turnover is less than 1 million Rand? Guys, can they register for VAT? Yes, they can, and if they do so, this is termed voluntary. registration. Okay, I'm sure you came across these two concepts when you completed VAT in class. Okay, let's move on to your next concept on VAT. Right, looking at your input VAT or VAT input, a description. I've already explained VAT input. VAT input, remember people, is the VAT that the business pays when they buy goods or services. So let's go through the actual definition given to us. VAT input is the VAT that is paid by the business to the supplier and they can, very important, they can claim back from SARS. In other words, it is the VAT that is paid on purchases. Now remember guys, what does the business normally buy? They've got to buy stock. A business also buys equipment, stationery, Okay, packing material, etc. All of these items normally include VAT, and the business can claim back the VAT that they've paid. All right, let's quickly go through the example. Purchase price, including VAT, is 600 Rand. VAT is charged, or the VAT charged is 73 Rand 68 cents, and that is your 14%. The amount to be claimed back from SARS, in this case, the business can claim back that VAT that they paid off 73 Rand and 68 cents. All right, next concept. Again, we've touched on this right at the beginning, but let's go through it one more time. What is VAT output? VAT output is VAT that the business charges on goods and services to their customers, and it must be paid over to SARS. This is VAT that is normally collected on sales. Example given to us, selling price including VAT is 1,399 Rand, 99 cents. That is charged is 171 Rand 93 cents. And again, people, there's that 14%. What is the amount to be paid over to SARS? 
the amount paid is the VAT that you've actually charged your customers, 171 Rand 93 cents. Okay. All right, let's move on to your next concept. The next concept is of VAT control. VAT control, people, remember, is the difference between your VAT output as well as your VAT input. It is a summary of the VAT input and VAT output and shows whether the business owes SARS money or whether SARS owes the business money, which sometimes can happen. Right, guys, if we look at this description a bit further, when the business owes SARS money, when will, when will that situation arise? It is when our output tax exceeds or is greater than our input tax. The other scenario, when will SARS owe the business money? So the second part of this description. SARS will owe the business money when your input tax or your input VAT is much greater or higher than your output VAT or your output tax. Right, let's look at the example that they've given us. So in this example, my output VAT is 171,000, sorry, 171 Rand, 93 cents. So there's my output. If I look at my input, the input VAT that I can claim back from the receiver is 73 Rand, 68 cents. The different clearly shows that we are going to be owing the receiver money. So the difference between the two, we've got to pay SARS this amount of 98 Rand, 25 cents. The difference between the two. Right, let's move on to the next concept. Right, we've touched on this, people, right at the beginning, but let's just explain this a bit further. What do we mean by exempt supplies? What, we mean, what do we mean by certain items are exempt from VAT? Now, remember, guys, exempt means that there is absolutely no VAT charged on these items whatsoever. It is exempt from VAT. The description... The law does not subject certain products or services to VAT at either the standard rate or at zero rate. In other words, there is no VAT that is charged on these items, on your exempt items. Let's take a look at the example of exempt items. Interest does not have any VAT. Okay? Export services, another example of an exempt item. Child care services, exempt. Educational services, your school fees, the, the school fees that your parents have to pay. They don't pay VAT on school fees. In other words, it is an exempt item. And then finally, services that are provided by associations not for profit. In other words, your non-profit organizations, like for example, the SPCA, they cannot charge us VAT on any items that they sell. Right, VAT, like I just said, cannot be added to the price of these items at all. These items are exempt. Let's move on to the next concept that you need to be familiar with, zero rated. Zero rated items are goods or services that are taxed at a rate of 0%. So in other words, there is VAT, but it is taxed at 0%. Now you're probably thinking, hang on, that's similar to exempt. What is the difference? There is a difference, people. The difference being that zero-rated items, although you cannot 
charge VAT on these items, the vendor can still claim back the VAT that they might have paid in the making of that product or rendering of that service. So for example, um, if we take brown bread, brown bread is considered to be a zero rated item. You do not pay VAT on brown bread. But in order for um, the business to or Albany rather, let's take Albany as an example because they make bread. If Albany, um, in order for them to make the bread, they obviously need to buy certain products, certain ingredients, they've got to pay transport costs, and during that time, they've got to pay that as well. So the receiver grants them that opportunity to claim back the input VAT that they've paid. But remember, when Albany is selling this bread to pick and pay or to spa, they cannot charge the vendor or rather the business that 14% VAT. It is zero rated. Okay, your examples, I spoke about brown bread. Then milk is zero rated, maize products, rice, lentils, and you've got a whole list of items that are zero rated. So let's now look at how exactly is VAT calculated? What are the transactions that you can expect in an exam? Remember, earlier on we've discussed the VAT concepts. Now we're looking at the transactions involving VAT. So let's look at some of the common transactions and then we can start with an example. So let's start with the transactions. Okay, the first transaction, trading stock purchased. Immediately, the word purchased tells you that if the business purchased stock, they would pay VAT. And whenever the business pays VAT, this is your input VAT or VAT input. The next transaction, trading stock sales. Sales as in the business is selling the stock. So every time the business sells stock, they will charge VAT and that VAT is called output VAT. The third common transaction that you guys are going to come across, purchase of fixed assets. So for example, if the business has to buy new equipment or the business had to buy a new delivery van, whenever the business purchases any fixed assets, again, like with the purchase of trading stock, the business will pay input that. Then we've got sale of fixed asset. The word sale gives it away. Every time the business sells a fixed asset, they will charge output VAT. All right, next common adjustment that you're going to come across. Income items, rent income, etc., excluding interest income. So if I come across rent, rent income, commission income, remember people, this is income that I receive. So I'll obviously as a business charge my customers or charge my tenant that on that rent. So the moment I am charging that, that VAT is known as VAT output or output VAT. Expense items, so if the business has to pay for rent, rent expense, the business has to pay for telephone, the business has to pay for fuel, rates, water and electricity, telephone, the business will normally pay input that. The item that I did not discuss is interest because we came across interest. Interest is an exempt item. We don't pay VAT on interest expense. All right, guys, the very last thing that I want to look at before we start with the first example is your ledger accounts and the format of your three ledger accounts. Let's look at the first format or let's look at the very first account, your VAT output account. That output, I explained earlier, is a liability. On the debit side, your liability decreases. On the credit side, your liability will increase. 
We've learned from grade eight all the way up until now that all liabilities have a credit opening balance. So there is a possibility that you could have a balance brought down for your VAT output. When will that balance increase? Every time you collect VAT on behalf of SARS. So for example, every time there is a sale, your VAT output is going to increase. So if there's a cash sale, remember a cash sale, contra account is bank, VAT output increases. Every time you sell on credit, so every time there's a credit sale, contra account debtors control, again, your VAT output is going to increase. Drawings, an item um, when the owner takes away goods from the business. If the owner takes away stock from the business, the business has to charge the owner VAT. And again, that VAT will increase your VAT output, or that amount rather will increase your VAT output. When will VAT output decrease? Every time your customers return items. So for example, you've sold something on credit, you charge the customer VAT, but that customer now is not happy with the product and comes back to your shop the next day to return the product. If the customer returns the product, remember you can't charge that customer VAT anymore. So immediately your VAT output on all returns okay, goes on the debit side. In other words, it decreases your VAT output. Bad debts is another example where your VAT output will decrease. Um, and then in the end, guys, all we have to do with this account is close off. I'm going to write the word here. We close off this account to VAT control. In other words, we try and calculate how much of VAT output we've got to pay the receiver by closing this off to our VAT control account. Your next account, input VAT or VAT input, let's just change the color there. Okay, VAT input, like I explained earlier, is an asset. On the debit side, assets increase. On the credit side, assets decrease. Now remember guys, VAT input is the VAT that I can claim back from the receiver. In other words, it's the VAT that the receiver owes me or owes the business. So every time the business buys and they buy using cash or using a check, the amount of VAT they can claim back will increase. Okay, and the entry, yes, in the CPJ, and obviously you enter your amount. Every time the business buys on credit, so again the word buy, okay, every time the business buys on credit, again, they are allowed to claim back that VAT from the receiver. And then finally, if the business uses uh, money from petty cash to buy, for certain, uh, to buy certain items like stationery or postage or whatever the case may be, again, guys, they are allowed to claim back this VAT from the receiver. What decreases your VAT output, sorry, VAT input rather, not output, Whenever you are unhappy, you as in the business, if you are unhappy with something that you've bought, you can obviously take it back to your creditor. And as a result, because you now have returned the item that you bought, you can't claim that VAT. So this would reduce the VAT input that you can claim from the receiver. And then finally, guys, like we saw with your VAT output account, um, at the end of this account, we need to close off VAT input. So I'll just again write off, write down rather. We're going to close off VAT input to VAT control account. Okay, guys, the very last account that we're looking at is your actual VAT control account. Remember, people, this account can either be an asset or it can be a liability. If I am owing 
I as in the business. If the business is owing the receiver money, that is considered to be a liability. But if SARS is owing or the receiver is owing the business money, that is considered to be an asset. So when we draft this account, we can end up with either a debit balance or a credit balance. That can either be an asset or a liability. Right, guys, we looked at some concepts. We looked at um, some ledger accounts. I think we're ready now to begin with an exercise. Let's now look at the very first example on that. Right, question one. This is a question on that, and it has a bit of ethics as well. Let's look at the very first question. What is the difference between output VAT and input VAT? And this question for marks. So a bit of theory. Right, we've already discussed this. Output VAT Okay, this is VAT that is charged on goods or services by a registered VAT vendor. Okay, two easy marks. What is output VAT? We've discussed this already. Let's look at the second part of the question. What is input VAT? Okay, let's just extend the page there and let's change the color of our pens. Input VAT. Okay, input VAT, guys, I've already explained. This is VAT that can be claimed from the receiver or from um, let's just fix that. Okay, from SARS when the business buys goods or when the business pays for certain expenses. All right, so this would also be two marks. So four marks, guys, just for knowing the definition of output fat versus input fat. Let's move on to the next question. The next question, at what rate is that currently being charged in South Africa? In other words, what is the standard rate for that? Absolutely correct. Again, two easy marks. The current rate or the standard rate is 14%, and I've got my two marks. All right, let's move on. The third question, is the current rate of VAT being charged on all goods in South Africa? And they want you to explain. In other words, are all goods subjected to this 14% rate in terms of VAT? Okay, what do you think? Answer is no, absolutely correct. Right, why is the answer no? Because we know that certain products are exempt from VAT and certain products are zero rated. So your explanation, we basically explaining that certain products are exempt. So you also have exempt supplies Okay, and we also have certain products that are zero rated. And again, guys, I've gone through the definition. In your answer, I'm not going to rewrite this. All you've got to do is explain what are exempt supplies as well as what are zero rated supplies. Right, easy stuff. Let's move on now to the next question, 1.4. George Gummy. The owner of Gummy Traders wants to know how much he owes SARS in respect of VAT 
for the two-month period July and the month of August 2008. Calculate the amount owing to SARS based on the following figures. Okay, so you've got this entrepreneur, George Gummy, and he wants to know how much of tax or how much of VAT he is owing the receiver of the revenue, uh, receiver of revenue. Let's read on. Okay, your answer, when you get to your answer, you are instructed to round off to the nearest cents, the information that's been given to me. Total sales for the month of July and August is 880,800 Rand, and they tell me it is exclusive of that. Right, guys, remember, firstly, total sales. Whenever you see the word sales, you know that this is VAT that is charged to your customers, hence it represents output VAT. Exclusive of VAT, we came across this. Excluding meaning without VAT. Now if we had to give this a percentage, excluding VAT is my 100% percent because remember including that I add on the 14 percent for it to become a hundred and fourteen percent so this amount given to me excludes that and therefore represents a hundred percent let's move on total purchases for the month of July and August is 415,500 Rand and here they tell me this is inclusive of that. Total purchases guys, whenever you see the word purchase, remember this is the VAT that the business or George rather can claim back from the receiver. So whenever the business can claim back from the receiver, this represents my input VAT. Let's move on. Inclusive of VAT. If excluding VAT is 100%, including VAT to that 100%, I am adding my 14% to give me a percentage of 114%. So this figure here includes VAT, therefore it represents as a percentage 114%. Right, last bit of information before I can do my calculation. What is my purchase of equipment in July? Sorry, let's just start over. Purchase of equipment in July, 65,000 Rand, inclusive of VAT. Again, guys, the word purchase clearly tells me this is input VAT. And again, I've got inclusive of that we've already discussed this if I had to convert this to a percentage inclusive of that is a hundred and fourteen percent right we're ready to do our calculation so let's start let's just change the color to let's go for the green right let's firstly calculate what is our VAT output Okay, so our very first transaction, there's our output VAT, total sales for July and August, so there's our total sales, 880,800 Rand, times, I want to calculate what is my VAT output. In other words, remember the VAT output represents the 14%. That's what I want to calculate. So I'm going to multiply this by 14%, and divide it by what do I have? In other words, what does this amount represent as a percentage? I've already explained this amount represents 100%. So the total VAT that I've charged my consumers, if I take, let's get our calculators out. All right, there's our calculator people. So the amount 880,800 times this by 14 okay and then we're going to divide it by a hundred and the VAT that we've charged our consumers or charged our customers 123,312 so let's just fill that in 123,312 let's just double check that yeah there we go 
Okay, so that's my total VAT output, or rather gummy stores, that is their total VAT output. Right, let's now move on. In order for me to calculate VAT, I've got my VAT output, but I now need to work out what is the VAT input that I can claim from the receiver. So let's now calculate our VAT input. Okay, back to the information second bit of information total purchases for July and August was 415,500 Rand it's inclusive of that so this we know represents input then I've got purchase of equipment in July 65,000 again inclusive of that so in other words these two items include that and I'm going to use these two items now to calculate what is the total VAT input I can claim back from the receiver. So let's start with your total purchases. The second adjustment given to me, it is 415,500. Okay, then I've got purchase of equipment also inclusive of VAT. So I'm going to add on 65,000. I'm just going to put this in brackets, people. I now want to, again, calculate the VAT. So I'm, I want 14% over or divided by what do I have? I've got an amount which is inclusive of VAT. Hence, in terms of percentage, it is 114%. Right, let's get, there's our calculator. Let's work out our VAT input. So 415,500 plus 65,000 times 14, and we're going to divide by 114. Okay, and that gives me the VAT that I can claim back from the receiver, 59,008 Rand. Remember, guys, we need to round off to the nearest cents, so that would give me 77 cents. So let's write that in. Okay, we've got 59,008 Rand and 77 cents. That is the amount of VAT that I can claim back from the receiver. Right, guys, once we've got our VAT output, we have our VAT input, we can now calculate what is the VAT payable or refundable by SARS. So let's do that calculation. So we've got, let's just extend the page a bit here. So there's my VAT output. So this is the VAT that I've charged my customers. This is the VAT that I can claim back from the receiver. We can clearly see that your VAT output is much greater than your VAT input, so that means that gummy stores will be owing the receiver. So my VAT payable to the receiver would be the difference between these two amounts that we've just calculated, 123,312, and we're going to subtract 59,008 Rand. 77 cents. So again, let's get the calculator out. Okay, so we've got that output 123312. We are going to subtract 59,008 Rand 77 cents. And that is the VAT, guys, that we now need to pay the receiver 64,303 Rand 23 cents. Okay, so that amount, people, 64,303 Rand, 23 cents. Let's just double check that. There we go. Okay, so that's the amount of VAT that needs to be paid to the receiver. All right, guys, let's move on now to our next question, 1.5. And this is a question on ethics. Okay, let's read the question. George Gummy regularly purchases goods from sneaky stores. Now guys, I don't know about you, but the moment I see um, a name such as sneaky stores, I'm going to expect a bit of sneakiness in this question. So let's just read on. The owner has offered you a special price 
the owner, meaning the owner of Sneaky Stores, has offered you a special price of 6,800 Rand, including that, instead of the normal price of 700, sorry, 7,400 Rand. Right, immediately, nothing illegal about that, nothing wrong about that. Instead of the business or instead of gummy stores paying 7,400 Rand, they are being offered a price of 6,800 Rand. So, so far, everything seems okay, provided you pay cash and do not require a document a document or documentation. Aha, so there, there comes the sneaky bit that we were suspecting. Um, remember people, whenever you buy a product, you are normally given some kind of documentation as proof that you've bought the product. So in this case, Gummy Stores wants to purchase something from Sneaky Stores and they are offered or they are given a purchase price of 6,800 Rand instead of the normal price, which is 7,400 Rand, but there are conditions attached to this particular purchase. So if you want to buy this product at 6,800 Rand, I'm not going to give you any invoice. I'm not giving you any documentation. And in order for this to be not traceable, you need to pay me cash. Now, remember, people, we've always learned in accounting that businesses when making payments, they do so by check or via an el electronic transfer, but no business uses cash to make payments. And also, if you buy or if you sell, there needs to be proper source documents that are completed, in this case, an invoice. Right, let's read on. George is tempted as this seems like a good offer. Obviously, guys, obviously it seems like a good offer. Instead of paying 6,000, sorry, instead of paying 7,400 Rand, if I'm only going to pay 6,800 Rand, yes, there is temptation. There's going to be a savings of 600 Rand. So, so he is, in this case, George is tempted to accept the offer. Advise him as to whether he should accept the offer, and then you are asked to briefly explain. Now, before we look at the actual answer, guys, let's just talk about this quickly. There's an offer made to you. In this case, it's made to George. Now, remember, in terms of that, um, ethics comes into play. I cannot claim for something or I cannot claim for VAT if I haven't paid VAT. What proof do I have that I've actually paid for the VAT? The proof lies in the source document itself. So without that source document, I can't, or George in this case, will not be able to claim back that 14%. Then, Turning the tables around in terms of sneaky stores. Sneaky stores wants to include VAT in this actual sale of 6,800 Rand. But remember, that VAT, because there's no documentation, Sneaky Stores is not going to pay that VAT over to the receiver of revenue. So that money is going to go into their account the sale as well as the VAT that they are charging, but they obviously are not going to pay that VAT over to the receiver. Now, remember, guys, this is unethical business practice. In other words, it is an offer that George should not accept. Although, yes, he's tempted to, yes, there is a savings, ethics comes into play. So let's look at the answer. It is unethical to accept offers like this, as it is obvious that sneaky stores will not record this as a sale. How do we know that they are not going to record this as, this as a sale? Because there's no documentation. And remember, guys, you need to have proper source documents, then you record the entries in your cash receipts journal or if sold on credit in your debtor's journal. There has to be proper documentation. In this case, there isn't. And therefore, so because there's no source documents, 
there's no trace of the sale, it will not be reflecting or it will not reflect to SARS. The reputation of gummy stores is at stake. So if there's any kind of VAT um, audit on gummy stores and um, it is discovered that gummy stores is buying goods without proper documentation um, and they they claiming back the VAT, the reputation of, the, of this business is at stake. Okay. Right, guys, we've come to the end of question one. We've looked at VAT calculations in this question. We looked at certain VAT terminology. We've also touched a bit on ethics. We're now ready to move on to our next section, which is stock valuations. But before we actually move on to stock valuations, I think we need a bit of a break. So let's take a very short break, and I'll see you guys soon. Welcome back, guys. In the previous question, our focus was on value-added tax. We can now move on to stock valuations. So let's st start by looking at, firstly, what is this section all about? Let's do a quick recap on stock valuations. Right, guys, stock, we all know, is obviously items that the business buys in order to sell to their consumers. Now, in this section itself, when we talk about stock, we are referring to stock at year end. Okay, year end, people, is my closing stock. Okay, valuation, the word valuation itself. How do I value stock at the end of the year. In other words, what is the method that I use in order to value my closing stock? Now, in accounting or in grade 12 accounting, you've learned that there are two methods of stock valuations. The first being FIFO, which stands for first in, first out method. And the second method is my weighted average method okay guys these are the two methods that i'm sure you've come across and we obviously going to just do a quick recap on what is the fifo method and what is the weighted average method what's the difference between the two right now before we actually look at the differences let's look at why why do we need fifo why do we need weighted average surely if i have the number of units on hand. So for example, at year end, I've counted in my shop, I've got 100 slabs of chocolates. Each chocolate has a cost price of, let's assume, six rand. Surely, the closing value of my stock is 100 times the six rand to give me 600 rand. Obviously, that's the amount that I should take to my balance sheet as my closing stock figure. Now, why doesn't this work? Why, why do I have to use FIFO or weighted average? People, that's because in reality, the, the cost price does not remain constant. Cost price changes all the time, changes on a monthly basis, sometimes even on a weekly basis. So the chocolates, while I could have bought it at six rand, it could have been, um, there could have been a price increase during the course of the month. So from my 100 slabs that I have available. Let's just extend this page a bit here. So from that 100 slabs that I have at the end of the year, I could have purchased 60 slabs at 6 rand each and the remaining 40 at 7 rand each. So immediately, guys, can you see the price has changed. The price has increased. And as a result, I cannot take my 100 chocolates and times it by one amount. I've either got to use the FIFO method, first in, first out method, or the weighted average method. All right, guys, let's talk about these two methods. Let's just do a quick recap on what is FIFO and what is, for, uh, what is weighted average. Okay, so I'm just going to use a different color and extend the page a bit. Let's start with FIFO. Okay, first in, first out. It simply means the products that the business buys first 
it is normally assumed they will try and sell those products first. So obviously, stock that remains is coming from the purchase that was made right at the end. So I'm going to give you guys a quick example. I'm going to stick with chocolates. Let's assume I bought 10 chocolates in the month of May. Um, and I paid 2 Rand each. So obviously, the value of my chocolates is 20 Rand. Then in the month of June, I bought 20 chocolates. I paid 3 Rand. So the value of my chocolates is 20 times 3 to give me 60 Rand. If I had to ask you what is the total purchase of chocolates that you made for the year, 10 plus 20, I bought 30 chocolates in total. What was the total purchase price paid? 20 plus 60 to give me 80 Rand. Now let's assume at the end of the year, I give you a scenario where you have, from the 30, you've sold a total of 20, which means your closing number of units or the number of chocolates that you have is 10. So at the end of the year, in my shop, I've got 10 chocolates. So remember, guys, that 10 chocolates now needs to be valued. I need to attach a RAND value to this unit itself. So let's now look at the first in, first out method. The 10 chocolates, in other words, my closing stock. Okay, that's the number of units I have available at the end. That 10 chocolates obviously comes from my purchases. Now remember, first in, first out. Like I just explained, whatever stock I bought first, it is assumed I will sell first. So obviously that 10 chocolates that I bought in May would have been sold. The second purchase that I made, where I bought 20 chocolates, did I sell all of those chocolates? The answer is no, because there's obviously 10 remaining at the end of the year or at the end of this particular month. So if I look at the 10 chocolates remaining, it had to come from the purchase that I made in the month of June the very last purchase that I made. So those or the 10 chocolates remaining has to have a value of 3 Rand each, which means if I calculate the value of my chocolates times it by 3 Rand, so 10 times 3 Rand, the value of my closing stock is 30 Rand, and this is the amount I can take to my balance sheet as my closing stock. So that is FIFO, first in, first out. Let's now look at what do we mean by weighted average? How does weighted average change? Okay, so again, let's just extend the page there. Okay, weighted average. Again, guys, I'm going to use the exact same scenario. So for the month of May, we bought 10 chocolates at 2 Rand each. And my closing, uh, sorry, not my closing stock, but the value of the chocolates is 20 Rand. For the month of June, I then purchased 20 chocolates at 3 Rand each. Okay, so the value of that purchase is an amount of 60 Rand. Again, guys, I purchased a total of 30 chocolates, and the Rand value of my stock, if I add again, 80 Rand. Right, exact same situation, guys. I'm now telling you at the end of the year, you now have, from this purchase, you've got 10 chocolates remaining, work out what is the value of this closing stock. So in order for me now to work out the value, I need to first work out what is that weighted average, the key word being average. What is that average purchase price that I've paid for the entire year? On average, what did these chocolates cost me? What did one chocolate cost me? So in order for me to calculate my weighted average, okay, all I'm doing, people, is taking the total value of my chocolates, which in this case is 80 Rand, 
divide this by the number of chocolates I've bought for the entire year, which is an amount of 30. So divide it by 30. Let's just get our calculators out. So I've got 80 divided by the total number of chocolates that I bought for the year, 30. And that gives me an average or a weighted average price of 2 rand 67 cents, if I round off to the nearest cents. So on average, these chocolates costed me 2 rand 67 cents. That was the average price of the chocolates. Right, guys, once you've got that average price, remember the question or the normal question would be, what is the value of your closing stock? I've got 10 chocolates at the end of the year. Each has an average price of 2 rand 67. So 10 times 2 rand 67. And the value, times that by 10, and the value of your closing stock is 26 rand 67 cents. Okay, let's just fill that in. 26 rand 67 cents. So that's your closing stock. Okay, people, this section is really not difficult. It's just a matter of you understanding the difference in calculation between first in, first out method and, uh, and of course, the weighted average method. Right, I think let's, let's start with an exercise. Let's look at an example where we're going to apply what we've just recapped on. Okay, so the e example or the question that we're looking at, we're looking at question two, inventory valuation control. This question has a bit of that. I'm not sure whether we're going to get to the that question or not. But for now, let's look at the inventory valuation question or the stock valuation question. Laser stores sells television sets to the public. The financial year ends on the 28th of Feb, 2009. They are unsure which method to use in valuing their stock. Now remember guys, whenever they mention the word valuing stock, they're referring to their closing stock. So they're unsure which method to use. Should I use the first in, first out method? Should I use the weighted average method? The cost price of the product has changed significantly during the current year. In other words, the cost has not remained constant. It, it has constantly changed. The owner, Larry Laser, has decided to keep selling the same model of the TV set. So they give you the name of the particular TV set, Mabona TV sets, and then they're giving you a model or a serial number. Despite the fact that other shops are selling newer models. So you've got this owner, he's selling a particular TV um, and, and it's obviously quite an old model or quite an old make, uh, but he's decided he's going to continue selling this particular television set. Right, let's look at what is required. We require to calculate the value of closing stock, firstly using the FIFO method. Okay. The next question, we are going to calculate the value of closing stock using the weighted average method. Guys, I'm just going through the entire question first, and then I'm going to go back to, obviously, the first part of the question. The third question you are then asked which method of stock valuation would you advise the owner to use? In other words, should he use the first in, first out method or should he use the weighted average method and then give a reason for your answer? Okay, and then we get to the actual information. Now, this is what I wanted to get to before we looked at the questions. So let's now look at the information that they are giving us. The following information appeared in the records of laser stores for the year ended 28 Feb 2009. The business uses a fixed 
selling price. Fixed selling price, in other words, the price hasn't changed for the entire year. So at the beginning of the year, they were selling the television set at 16,000 Rand. At the end of the year, that cost, that selling price has remained the same. It has not changed. Okay, the information that we've got, we firstly have number of TV sets, so the actual units, value per unit, so what is the cost for one unit, and then the total value of the units. In other words, your unit times the actual value of one, okay, to give me the total value. So let's go through this table. TV sets on hand on the 1st of March 2008. Remember, guys, 1st March 2008. If the financial year ended on the 28th of Feb 2009, 1st March would be at the beginning of the year. So at the beginning of the year, they have 50 TV sets. Each has a value of 11,000. Total value, all you're doing is multiplying to get the total value of your opening stock, 550,000. If we move on, TV sets bought during the year. So if we look at the individual months, for the month of May 2008, we bought 300 units, paid 12,000 Rand per unit. So in total for that month, we spent 3,600,000. Okay, then they give us information for September 2008. Here we bought 250 units. Again, we notice, or rather we notice in this case, the cost price that we bought decreased. So from 12,000, it now is 11,560 Rand. And then again, the total value given to me. For the month of February, we purchased 200 units. And again, guys, can you see that the cost price has dropped. It's dropped to 8,000 Rand and the total value 1,600,000. Okay, so clearly we're seeing a trend of where this TV set is no longer in demand because there's newer models available, better quality, better sound, better picture, all those plasma screens that you have. So obviously, the older models, their value is decreasing. The cost price is decreasing. Right, if we move on, the subtotal, the subtotal, guys, is merely the number of units that I actually have available. Okay. Right, so available. I've got my opening stock plus what I purchased, so 50 plus in total I purchased 750, so I've got 800 TV sets to sell. Total value, again guys, all we're doing is the opening stock, we are adding on our total purchase to get the total value, which is 8,640,000. That's the total value of the 800 television sets. They go on to tell us TV sets sold during the year. So out of that 800 that we have, we've sold 440, which means the TV sets on hand on the 28th of Feb 2009. Immediately, guys, this is end of the year. Your closing stock. So at the end of the year, let's just extend the page there a bit. At the end of the year, we have available... If I subtract 800 minus 440, in our shop, we have 360 television sets. The value is not given because, remember, this business doesn't know whether to use weighted average or the FIFO method. And again, the total value is not given. Okay, so there's our information. Let's now go to the actual questions itself and let's answer our question. Okay, we're just going back a bit. Right, there's our first question, guys. We are asked to calculate the value of closing stock using the FIFO method. So in other words, the first in, first out method. 
Okay, we're going to start by looking at what is the actual number of units that we have available at the end of the year. We came across that figure, I think it was 360, but let's just quickly go back to the actual information. Okay, there we go. End of the year, we've got 360. So that's the actual number of units that we have. Guys, I think what I'm going to do, instead of me going back all the time, let's just write down 2.1.1, and we are calculating closing stock using the FIFO method. So at the end of the year, we've got 360 television sets on hand. Now remember people, FIFO, whatever I buy first, I sell first. So obviously the closing stock has to come from the last purchase. So let's now go to the very last purchase. The last purchase was made in the month of February. So in Feb 2009, we bought 200 television sets. And if I go to my closing stock, my closing stock is sitting at 360. So obviously people, that 360 is made up of that very last purchase, which is the 200 television sets. Let's now look at the balance. 360 minus the 200. In other words, where now does the 160 television sets come from? Which purchase does this come from? This has to come from, if I've now taken into account the 200 Rand, I now look at the previous purchase or the previous month, which is September 2008. So in September 2008, we purchased 250 units, but from that 250 units, we've obviously not sold 160 television sets. Okay, you guys with me there? I'm just going to repeat this calculation one more time. First in, first out. Whatever I buy first, I try and sell first. So obviously from this 360 television sets, it's the very last purchase that has not yet been sold, which was 200 units. I've written down the 200 units. I now, from my calculation, I can see there's still 160 units. Where then does this come from, guys? It comes from the previous month, which is September, where I haven't sold from the 250 that I bought, I haven't sold 160. Right, once I've worked out the number of units, now let's work out the actual RAND value. So if I look at my very last purchase, the 200 units, the cost price was 800 RAND. So I'm going to multiply this by. 800, sorry, not 800, but rather 8,000 Rand. 200, let's get our calculators out there. So 200 times 8,000 to give me 1,600,000. So let's just fill that in 1,600,000. Okay, second part the 160 units. It's coming from the purchase that was made in the month of September. And in September, we've paid a cost price of 11,560. So times this by 11,000, let's just put our RAND sign there, 11,560 to work out a value of, okay, so 160 times 11,000 560 to give me a value of 1,849,600. So let's fill that in. Okay. 1,800, got to go back there, 4960. 49,600. Okay, I'm just going to double check people. Okay, there we go. Absolutely correct. Right, all that's left for us to do, we want to calculate, remember people, the question wants us to calculate what is the actual RAND value of the 360 television sets that we have. So our RAND value in total or the value of our closing stock is simply now an addition of 
these two amounts that we've just calculated. So let's just fix that a bit there. Let's get the calculators back. So all we're doing, guys, is adding on to plus 1,600,000, and there is the value of my closing stock, 3,449,600. So let's just write that in, guys. 3,449,600. Okay, let's just fix that there. Double check. Yep, there we go. Okay, that was question one. Easy, straightforward, um, using the knowledge that you have on FIFO and applying it to an actual question. Right, guys, let's move on to the next question. Okay, and again, guys, I think I'm going to do the question itself, or rather answer the question itself on this particular page, so 2.1.2. The second question wants me to calculate the closing stock, but not using FIFO, rather using weighted average. Okay, so for the quest second question, I'm calculating my closing stock, but this time I'm using the weighted average method. So let's see how different the weighted average value is going to be from the first in, first out method. Right, guys, what I'm going to do is let's just quickly change the color to green so we know weighted average. We're going to do our calculations in green. Right, for the weighted average, again, people, I know I've got 360 units, and I now need to calculate what is the closing stock using this method of valuation. So using my 360 units, I'm going to multiply this by a weighted average price. Okay, I need to calculate what is that weighted average or what is that average price that we've paid for, our, for the television sets. So let's now calculate weighted average price first. That's what we've got to do first before we work out the actual value of the closing stock. So in order for me to calculate, calculate my weighted average price, I am going to take the value of, okay, so I'm going to take the value of the value of the total goods available just as I did with the chocolates I took the value of the total chocolates and I'm going to divide this by the number of units available the number of television sets we had for the entire year. Okay, let's go to our information and let's look at which figures I'm going to take through to my calculation. So let's start with the total value of goods available. Okay, guys, there's that total value. Okay, the subtotal. Remember, people, subtotal was made up of the television sets we had on hand at the beginning of the year, plus we are adding the purchase of television sets during the year in order for us to get the total value of our goods available. In this case, 8,640,000. So let's take that amount through. The value of goods available is 8,600,000. Got to go back there. It's quite a big figure. 640,000. Okay, so that's the actual RAND value. I'm now going to divide this by the number of units that I have available. So back to your information. Again, guys, subtotal number of units that you had available is 800. A recap on how we got this 800. At the beginning of the year, we've got 50 television sets. During the year, we bought an additional 750, so in total, we've got 800 to sell out there to our customers. So we're going to divide this by 800. Okay, All right, let's get those calculators out. So we have this amount of 8,640,000, and we're dividing it by, just move this a bit. We're dividing this by 800, 
and there's that average price. So on average, we've been paying 10,800 Rand whenever we've been purchasing these television sets. So that's our average price, 10,800. Okay, once I've got my average price, guys, now it's straightforward. I take my 360 times that weighted average price that I've just calculated. So all we're doing is we are multiplying 10,800 times the 360 units that I have available. And that's going to give me, times it by 360, the value of my closing stock, guys, 3,888,000 using this method of valuation. Okay, so 3,888,000. Okay, I'm just going to put this answer in a block. Right, that's the value of my closing stock using the weighted average method. Okay, guys, now if you compare, if you look at the first in, first out method, and if you look at the weighted average method, you're going to see that there's going to be a difference in the actual value of closing stock. And that's what I want to look at before we look at the third question. So what I want to do quickly is, we already know that this is weighted okay the weighted average method and let's just get the pink pen out let's rewrite what was our FIFO method the FIFO method if we go a bit further up is the value of our closing stock three million four hundred and forty nine thousand six hundred three million four hundred and forty nine thousand six hundred Okay. Okay, guys. So as you can see, we've obviously got our closing stock, but we've used two different methods, completely different methods, and the difference, or there is obviously a difference between the two. Right, let's now look at the third question. I just want to go back to the question. And then we will continue on the same slide. For our third question, let's look at what we are calculating. Which method of stock valuation would you advise the owner to use? And you are required to give a reason for your answer. So let's go back to the page where we did our calculation, guys. OK, there we go. All right, the question once. A repeat of the question, which method of valuation should or will you advise the business to use? Should they use the weighted average method or should they use the FIFO method? Now remember guys, this is something that you learned in grade 11. Closing stock, the higher your closing stock, the higher your gross profit, the higher your gross profit, the higher your net profit. And the more profit the business shows, the better it is for that actual business itself. So if we look at our two amounts that we've just calculated, which one has the higher closing stock? Okay, it's obviously, people, the weighted average method. So if we look at the weighted average, this is a higher value of my closing stock. And the higher the value of my closing stock, remember people in grade 11, you completed an account called the trading account. Okay, trading account helps you to calculate gross profit. So trading account was owner's equity, minus on the debit side, plus on the credit side, and your closing stock just fix that. Your closing stock normally appears on the credit side of this particular T account. So the higher your closing stock, the greater, let's just get that pen out, the greater or the higher, the higher the profit that goes to the owner. Okay, guys, there seems to work now. So the higher your closing stock, the higher the profit that goes to the owner 
and as a result he'll be very happy because he wants a higher profit so I would recommend in this case that we choose the weighted average okay let's just label this this is 2.1.3 guys I would advise the business to choose the weighted average method and remember the question wanted me to provide a reason why am I choosing the weighted average method the business will show a higher gross profit right guys we've come to the end of the session unfortunately we can't move on we've run out of time um, remember people we covered that we did a bit of stock valuations you guys need to now practice 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 do as many exercises as you can on VAT. remember to learn your VAT concepts learn your calculations revise your calculations and you should be absolutely fine for that year-end exam good luck grade 12s god bless and from me it's goodbye